Hello there guys, and welcome back to another Trade the Explainer video. And today I'd like to take some time to talk about cave paintings and other examples of Stone Age art. Cave paintings for most probably don't even need an introduction. The beautiful illustrations made by early Homo sapiens, and maybe some by Neanderthals, etched on the walls of countless subterranean abodes throughout Eurasia, Africa, and Australia, are renowned and pretty much make up the quintessential stereotyped caveman image. In addition to these cave paintings, archaeologists have uncovered countless figurines and sculptures made of stone, clay, and other materials carved by the hands and fingers of our early ancestors. This kind of artwork has always fascinated me for some reason, and I think they create a similar feeling in many other people. I think there's just something magical and awe-inspiring to comprehend that someone, an actual person, long dead and their names forgotten, drew or shaped this. They took it upon themselves to tell us what they saw. Why? They drew this with fingers painted red and sticks tipped with charcoal because they wanted somebody else to see it, to see what they saw, to share their world. And this message between the eons has been transmitted to you and me. The two of us will never know one another in the slightest, but we can communicate nonetheless. This is what culture is, and I think it's the very essence of being human. And when gazing at these kind of illustrations and carvings, one ponders, what was the world of these people like? What did they see? What did they believe in? Fortunately, our work produced by these people can tell us some of this information, and today I'd like to talk about what we can possibly learn about prehistory from Paleolithic artwork. Extinct Animals Depictions of animals are probably the most common that appear in Stone Age art. One can find hundreds of sketches of beasts which appear to dance along the walls of caves like Lascaux and Chauvet. The most common depictions are of horses and aurochs. There are literally hundreds if not thousands of depictions of these animals, but littered between them are those of mammoths, woolly rhinos, Irish elk, and so on. It is no surprise to find out that this kind of artwork is especially helpful to paleontologists as it gives us the closest look we will ever get at seeing some of these animals in the flesh. Some cave art can actually tell us a lot we wouldn't be able to know otherwise. Having depictions made from contemporary eyewitnesses has helped give insight into the truth about many extinct animals in fact, most famously the dodo bird of Mauritius. This flightless island-dwelling pigeon became extinct in the 1600s, long before photography, and after it was bludgeoned, eaten, and starved into extinction, it left no complete specimens for scientists to examine. Much of what we know about the dodo's behavior and complete external appearance, such as posture and coloration, is surprisingly a mystery. Scientists have had to mainly use the scattered and often contradictory descriptions and illustrations made by those who saw them in life, the few that there were. By the 1800s, scientists pieced together from European paintings and sketches that the dodo was clumsy and fat, with a plump body on squat legs. However, scientists have since recognized that this image of the dodo appears to be inaccurate. These depictions appear to have made referencing crudely stuffed models of the bird, or overly fed cage specimens as opposed to the wild and natural birds. Many depictions appear to merely be copied versions of prior illustrations and not wholly original. The famous Edwards dodo painting for centuries served as the most iconic reconstruction of the bird and was blindly copied by countless artists to the point that this image is what most people think of when they hear the dodo bird. In the 1950s, however, a painting was discovered in St. Petersburg. It was unsigned and how it ended up in Russia is a bit of a mystery. But one thing is clear, it was created in the 17th century and depicts a dodo bird in its center, flanked on its sides by Indian birds. The art style is very clearly characteristic of a certain Mughal court artist by the name of Ustad Mansur, who loved to paint illustrations of plants and animals. His ability to accurately depict the organisms he saw was exceptional, so it raised a few eyebrows when his depiction of what appears to be a dodo bird differs greatly from the more traditional view. His dodo is slimmer, holds itself more upright, and is covered in grayish-brown coloration. All the neighboring birds possess the appropriate colors and shape as they do in life, and an English traveler, Peter Mundy, described that the Mughal emperor at the time possessed a pair of dodos in his menagerie as pets. It appears Manser based his depiction off of a living, breathing animal, and subsequent research showed that his image accurately matches the little skeletal evidence we have and some of the first depictions of the dodo bird made from life as an upright, walking, and slimmer bird. Just like that, it appears a single illustration changed our perception of an extinct animal forever. Perhaps artwork made by prehistoric humans could similarly shed some light on extinct animals. Well, let's go down the list and see what extinct animals we likely have depictions of, and see if any can actually tell us anything. Horses and aurochs. Well, as stated before, the overwhelmingly most common depictions of animals in Stone Age artwork are those of horses and aurochs. And although these animals aren't necessarily extinct, as the descendants of horses and aurochs do in fact survive today as our domesticated stallions and cows, their ancient prehistoric relatives appear to be vastly different. 
The aurochs was the wild ancestor to countless breeds of cattle we have today. From their bones, we can tell that these wild cows were massive, and there once were thousands of them widely spread throughout Europe and Asia during the Paleolithic. Our ancestors appear to have encountered them a great deal in prehistory, but unlike some of the other animals on this list, the wild aurochs survived for a great deal of time after these paintings were made, and were often described as living just beyond the edge of civilization. Julius Caesar describes his encounters with them during the Gallic Wars, stating they were a little below the elephant in size, and their strength and speed was extraordinary. The aurochs was often hunted for its enormous horns and hide, and by the 13th century they only existed in isolated regions in Eastern Europe. The lands they lived on became prized, and were often served as the restricted hunting grounds of nobles and royalty. Eventually, they became so rare that the hunting ceased, and it was a crime punishable by death to kill an aurochs. But even so, the damage appears to have already been done, and by 1627, the last aurochs died in Poland, leaving only ornamental gold-encrusted horns to collect dust in the palaces of kings. Their extinction was probably due to a combination of hunting, habitat destruction, and disease from their domesticated counterparts. Even with their relatively recent extinction, it might be a surprise to learn that these cave paintings are pretty much the only depictions of aurochs made from life that have survived over the centuries. Besides those of Lascal, Chauvet, and others, we have an engraving by Sigmund von Herbenstein, historian and diplomat of the Holy Roman Empire, published in a book in 1556, which has an inscription that reads, I am Oros, Tor in Polish, Aurochs in German. The ignorant ones have given me the name of Bison and a copy of an older painting by Charles Hamilton Smith, which appears to depict a cattle aurochs hybrid. The wild horse has a similar story to the aurochs. They were once very widely spread throughout Eurasia, but were domesticated and altered greatly from their wild ancestors. As they've discussed already in 10,000 BCE, cave art reveals that these wild horses were much shorter and stockier than those of today, and likely resembled a Przewalski's horse in body and shape and size. Our ancestors gave these horses a wide range of colors and patterns, from bay-colored horses to spotted, almost leopard-patterned horses. And surprisingly, even the most absurd of these colors and the paintings are in fact accurate in accordance to the scientific evidence, taken from the DNA of prehistoric horse bones. Eckenberry Cave in Spain possesses some of the most interesting horse colors. These horses have a strange M-shaped line across their sides of their midsections, and have striped, almost zebra-like necks and legs. This coloration hasn't been confirmed by DNA evidence, but the color's repetition throughout the cave seems to lend credence to some Ice Age horses possessing it. Mammoths. It goes without saying that the woolly mammoth is a common subject in paleo artwork. Perhaps the cave which offers the most depictions is the Rufenak Cave. This cave is home to 158 mammoth depictions, which represents around 70% of all the animal representations in the cave. My favorites is this one in Chavez with massive topads, and this one with a decorative spear thrower in the shape of a mammoth. A lot of these illustrations are incredibly detailed and accurate to what we know about mammoths from their mummies and fossils. Interestingly, in some illustrations, it appears the artist highlights some areas on the mammoth in particular, near the shoulder, a point which appears to have been a common area for spearheads to pierce. It seems like early humans might have used cave paintings as an educational tool in addition to artistic tools. Woolly rhinos, whose closest living relatives are the Sumatran rhinos, and I can't see why, aren't depicted in cave art as commonly as mammoths, aurochs, and horses. Up until 1994, only about 20 depictions existed. This all changed when the Chave Cave was discovered, which added around 60 new images. The rhinos in Chave are in a variety of poses and appear to show coloration. Some appear to depict battles and clashes between rhinos, no different than those of modern-day Africa. These Chave woolly rhinos might be able to tell us a little bit about their coloration. Many have darker colored fur, with a single dark band or belt across their belly, between their fore and hind limbs. It's unclear if this is a representation of the animal's actual coloration, or if this is like some of those highlighted areas on the mammoths, as a symbolic or simply artistic liberty. Such a coloration is rare in the animal kingdom, but who knows, maybe massive hairy rhinos with dark belts around their waists roamed prehistoric France. The Irish elk, or Megaloceros, was a truly awe-inspired animal. As the largest deer to ever existed, it stood a towering two meters at the shoulder. But what was probably most impressive was the male's ridiculous, and I mean ridiculous, antlers. The largest of any deer spanning just as wide as the animal was tall. I would love to just have been able to see a single male striding across an Ice Age prairie. Cave artists captured the majesty of this animal in particular, and that's call, by exaggerating the horns a bit, making them look a lot like gnarled branches. Cave art of the Irish elk, both male and female, appears to support the idea that they possessed a single dark-colored hump on their shoulders, much like that of a mammoth, something not preserved in any fossils. 
Europe a long time ago used to be as rich with wildlife as the African savanna of today, but just like many ecosystems, many of this rich wildlife is gone now. During the Ice Age, Europe was home to big cats and hyenas, who stalked endless herds of horses, deer, and cattle. Probably the most famous of these was the cave lion. The average individual stood about 1.2 meters at the shoulder, and would easily be as large as the largest known modern lions. Chauvet has offered some of the most detailed depictions of cave lions, and a full-body sketch appears to show a male and a female in profile. One is larger than the other and has a definite scrotum, while the other is smaller and lacks this feature. This illustration has given support to the idea that male cave lions, unlike their African relatives, did not possess a mane, or at least had a less defined one. Cave lions seem to have served a ritualistic or religious significance for our ancestors. The oldest depiction of any animal by a human is a lion-headed humanoid. The Leuvenminch figurine is dated to be about 35 to 40,000 years old and was carved out of mammoth ivory. It appears the lion-headed man is one of the first human-animal hybrids in cave art, and certainly not the last. This pretty much concludes all the definite and commonly accepted extinct animals in cave art, but I'll reference some of the lesser known and somewhat disputed ones. Just to clarify, it is uncertain if these depictions are in fact representation of these animals or not. We just don't know. Aboriginal rock art is said to depict a great deal of now extinct megafauna of Australia that these people must have encountered. The thylacine or Tasmanian tiger is commonly accepted to appear in rock art. The only recently extinct marsupial once existed in mainland Australia, but unfortunately became extinct there before Europeans even arrived. This is said to be a depiction of the marsupial lion, a carnivorous relative to the koala and wombat, which appears to have evolved from a herbivorous ancestor, accounting for its bizarre teeth which, instead of evolving from canines, like most mammals, evolved from molars into slicing chompers. If this actually is a marsupial lion is up for debate, as some have noted this could easily be a depiction of a thylacine. If this actually is a marsupial lion, it seems more fitting to call them a marsupial tiger. This is said to possibly be a depiction of a diprotodon, Australia's marsupial answer to the cow or hippo. These car-sized marsupials were part of the same family as the marsupial lion, being close relatives to the modern-day wombats. A 40,000-year-old rock art painting might depict the giant Australian fowl relative, Ginny Ornis, which likely coexisted with early Australians. However, again, some scientists have given alternative suggestions, such as the emu or other Australian bird species. This illustration is said to be of the trunk marsupial tapir, but I really don't see it, and like many of these paintings, their vagueness really doesn't help us with their identification. Sadly, Megalania, see, I finally said it, this was a paleoprofile Megalania all along, is completely absent in Aboriginal art. I know, I know, it sucks. This sketch of a large, single-horned rhinoceros has been suggested to be the only known depiction of Elasmatheria. If true, this would lend credence to their late survival and much larger extent in Western Europe. Similarly, a depiction of a straight-tusked elephant in El Castillo Cave in Spain might suggest Paleoloxodon might have existed in the region. As I've already discussed, this now lost figurine of a big cat might be the only known depiction of a saber-toothed cat ever made by a human, particularly of Homotherium, and it might give credence to the theory that saber-toothed cats actually had big, fleshy lips covering their canines, making them far more ridiculous looking. In addition to these creatures, there are a few as of yet unidentified and mythical ones that appear in cave artwork. The so-called Unicorn of Lascal appears to be a bulky, spotted, and horned creature. Its identity is unclear, but I can probably say it isn't a unicorn. Rather strangely, humans are almost entirely absent in Stone Age cave art. One can wander throughout the entirety of these caves, gazing at an entire two-dimensional zoo, but never find even the slightest hint of a human painted on the rocks. Why? We don't know exactly. Many of the few vaguely human depictions are that of human-animal hybrids. Lascaux is home to a few of these chimeric human and animal hybrids, in particular a bird-headed man and a minotaur. The Cave of the Three Brothers, made around 13,000 BCE, is home to the famous sorcerer image. Wait a second, what? Unfortunately, this famous sketch of the sorcerer made in the 1900s doesn't accurately reflect the real sorcerer illustration. The original painting is far more simplistic, and many elements like the antlers in the sketch are missing. Chauvet has only one depiction of a human in the entirety of the cave, a single naked woman's lower half with a bull caressing it. In fact, depictions of the lower halves of women, specifically centered on the private area, are exceptionally common throughout early artwork and are very, very widely spread. 
would have been dubbed the Venuses after the female Roman goddess, seem to have had an important but as of yet mysterious and unknown purpose to our ancestors. Are they representations of a fertility goddess or divine mother creation deity of some kind? Are they merely portraits of real or fictional people created as decoration? Are they a primitive form of pornography, the feminine contour serving as a sexual stimulant for Stone Age teens? We don't know, and we probably will never know. The Venuses often lack heads or faces, so their importance seems to be entirely focused on the hips, waist, and breasts of the woman. And they often have plump, exaggerated features, and yes, I'm going to say it because I know people will make sure they say it if I don't. They pretty much fit the modern description of thick, and I mean thick with two C's. The 3,000-year-old mask of La Roche Codard is said to be the oldest depiction of a human face, depicting two eyes and a nose. Its age might suggest it wasn't made by Homo sapien hands at all, but Neanderthal ones. This 27,000-year-old etching is said to also be an ancient and rudimentary portrait of a human face. Other notable human depictions include the detailed Adam of Macedonia, a over 7,000-year-old sculpture showing ribs, belly button, and other features, and the Insakri lovers, an 11,000-year-old carving found near Bethlehem, the oldest depiction of two humans engaged in intercourse. And yeah, that's about all I can say about the Stone Age artwork for now. What I find really fascinating, and I'll leave on this note, is how recently some of these works were discovered. The Chave Cave, which is home to a large portion of these depictions, and no doubt the most detailed and insightful, was left sealed and untouched, the walls collecting dust and the paintings fading for 30,000 years, and was only discovered in 1994 by complete accident when a few splunkers felt a faint air current deep within the earth. The images on the walls of the cave sat in the dark, waiting patiently to greet the next eyes to see it for tens of thousands of years. Almost the entirety of all known human history, from the invention of agriculture, to the triumphs of Alexander the Great, to the raidings of the Vikings, to the bloodiest battles of the First World War, all happened, the cave's existence none the wiser. Civilizations rose and faded, without knowing the beautiful gallery that existed below their feet. One questions if other caves, filled with just as beautiful and insightful works, exists below our own very feet. Who knows what types of things are yet to be discovered, waiting patiently in the dark. What mysteries are left to solve and simply to find. And thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. I had a lot of fun learning about artwork and prehistoric humans. And I'd be happy to talk more about human stuff in the future. Alright, next video is definitely going to be a cryptid profile or a paleo profile because I haven't done those in a very long time. Sorry for the long wait on this one, it's just very hectic right now and I hope you guys understand. Alright, see ya. Soft and warm, she'll touch my face, a bed of straw against the lace. We believe we'd catch the rainbow.